Hey, as, as we dive into the message this morning, uh, I am looking for some audience participation today. Uh, the title of our sermon is The Gospel Changes Marriage. And so, can I get a show of hands? Um, who, who's married? Yeah, go ahead and lift them up high. If you're married, lift them up high. Great. Uh, you put them down. Now, I don't want to embarrass anyone, uh, but I am looking for some audience participation. If you are single and, and you would like to be married, uh, can you lift your hand up? And keep them up. Go ahead and look around a little bit. Uh, you can see where each other are seated. Uh, we can make a love connection here at church today. <laughs> that is actually where my wife and I met, is here at RK Church. Um, a, few more, a few more questions for you. Uh, this one's for the ladies, whether you're single or whether you're married. Can, can you lift your hand up if, if you uh, dreamed about your wedding day when you were a little girl? Yeah? Keep your hand up if, if you dreamed about what type of dress you would wear when you were a little girl, what that would look like. All right, you can put your hands down. Uh, ladies, lift up your hands if, um, if you dreamed about your future husband carrying you over the threshold. A couple of you. What about this? Ladies, lift up your hands if uh, you had dreamed about the names of your un unborn babies before you even met your future husband. All right, guys, it's your turn. Guys, lift up your hands if, if you dreamed about your wedding day when you were a little boy. No one? <laughs> guys are just wired differently than women, right? Guys don't think like that. In fact, if a guy were to think about his wedding day, more than likely he's thinking, I'm thinking about sex. That, that's, that's how a guy thinks. And so inevitably, when, when a man gets married to a woman, there's going to be different expectations and different ideas about what marriage actually is, right? Uh, when, when people come together, there is going to be change. And marriage is all about change. And it should be. If, if you think about it, uh, if you are going to grow as a person you're going to have to change. And if you are going to grow in, in your relationship with your wife and you're going to grow deeper in love with one another, there's going to be a change, right? And so marriage is always going to be about changing somehow. Sometimes this change is out of our control and sometimes we have absolute control about the changes that are going to take place. Sometimes the change that takes, takes place in our relationships are good and they're healthy. And sometimes the change that takes place in our relationships are horrible. And we never want to repeat it again. But there's always going to be change in marriage. I learned this about 24 hours after I said my vows to my wife. Um, when, when, when I said my vows to Sarah, I was absolutely in love. It was like butterflies and puppy dogs and romantic music playing in the background. Uh, we were absolutely in love. But within the first 24 hours, I realized that she was not as perfect as I thought she was. And she realized that I was not as perfect as I thought I was. <laughs> the change had to happen. And, and in our marriage, um, we've been happily married for 10 and a half years. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, we've been married for 11 and a half years, but we've been happily married for the past 10 and a half years. Sorry, I've got to fix this microphone. Uh, we didn't have any big issues in our first year of marriage, but it was tough. It was really hard to learn what the other person expected and what they wanted. I, I didn't even know what I wanted or expected. And, and it was all these little things that, that were like rubbing at our marriage. We could connect with um, a couple named Allison and Patrick. Go ahead and watch this video here. Little things are really what I think got to us initially when we first were living together. I'll be getting ready in the morning and I'll hear this. Allison, it's an emergency. It's an emergency. And then I have to let him in the bathroom. Then he goes to the bathroom, and it's like this, and then I have to go in there and finish getting ready, and it's horrible, and I'm sick of my stomach, and I'm gagging, and I cannot stand that. 
And the other part that was really hard was that I like things really neat and orderly coming out of the military, and she would pretty much just throw her stuff wherever she felt like and just leave it a mess. Well, he says that I was spoiled <laughs> growing up, but I like to say that I was nurtured. He'll say, it's okay to put dishes in the dishwasher. It's okay when you're finished with the towel to hang it back up on the rack. And I think it's okay to leave it on the floor. And it's not something to totally stress out about. As far as she's concerned, that was my military life, and now she's trying to deprogram me. We have very different interests. She likes to go to museums and look at art and do artsy type things. He likes to go to the shooting range and shoot guns. She'll, you know, take me to these different things, you know, trying to broaden my insights and, you know, give me culture, but I don't care. I've said that I'm going to take a shooting class with him. I will attend some of the different plays and stuff that she wants to really see. And he has agreed to take swing dance lessons at some point. I feel that I've, I've changed more to fit into her life than she's changed to try to fit into life I would like. Can anyone relate? How many people have thought to yourself, something has to change? Well, I have good news for you. This series that we're going through is the gospel changes everything. And it really does. And today we're going to be looking at how the gospel changes marriage. If, if you are married, you know that marriage sometimes creates change. Uh, you know that sometimes people get into uh, different relationships and they're like, Okay, if you do this, I'll do that. If you do the dishes on, on Mondays and on Tuesdays, I'll do the dishes on, on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And, and we make these conditions with one another as far as how we're going to get things done and how things are going to work. Unfortunately, though, this is not the gospel. If you were to go to the bookstore right now and look at the self-help section and, and look at self-help for marriage, you will see hundreds upon hundreds of examples of boundaries that you could create in your marriage, of, of different rules that you could establish, or you will see advice that will say, you need to exert more effort, you need to try harder. This is old covenant type thinking, and it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, this is what a lot of people want, including Christians. We go in and we see that there needs to be change within our marriage, and so we, we try harder. We, we go, oh, if my spouse really loved me, they wouldn't do this. Or if my spouse really loved me, uh, they would do this for me. And so we begin to put terms and conditions on the relationship. And ultimately what happens is these terms and conditions don't produce lasting change. Today, I, I only have one point, and, and we're going to talk about this. And it's that real lasting change in your marriage is only going to come from a sustained vision in Jesus Christ. Let me say that one more time. Real lasting change in your marriage is only going to come from a sustained vision of Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 18. But before we get there, um, there's some things that I'd like to explain first. You see, in this passage, it's a little bit of an abstract passage. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to a, a hurting church in Corinth, and, and he is sharing two different covenants. He's talking about the Old Covenant, which is also referred to as the law, and so I'm going to use those interchangeably. So Paul is, is discussing the Old Covenant and the law, and he's comparing it to the New Covenant, or the Gospel. And, and he's comparing these two, and he's showing where one falls short, and where the other is way better. And over and over again, uh, the Gospel trumps the Old Covenant. The Gospel is better than the Old Covenant. And we're going to take a, a look at that and see why. And so before we get into our text, uh, we're going to talk about the Old Covenant for a little bit. Um, you'll see my definition up on the screen that the Old Covenant is a set of, of rules and regulations that God has given Israel on Mount Sinai. Again, the Old Covenant is, is a set of rules and regulations that God gave to Israel on Mount Sinai. 
If you know the Bible history, and I know some people may be well-versed in that, and other people, you're just checking things out, and, and you have no idea what the Old Covenant is. Uh, according to, to the Old Testament, in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, there is a story how the nation of Israel were enslaved for 400 years. For 400 years, this nation uh, had masters in Egypt that would tell them everything that they had to do. And so the nation of Israel was enslaved to another ruler. And God in his grace, he, he took this nation Israel and, and he had them exit Egypt. He rescued them from the land of Egypt. And they spent some time in the wilderness and out in the wilderness God showed them who he was. And he had a guy named Moses. Uh, perhaps many of you have seen some movies about Moses. Uh, some, some white guys dressing up as Jewish people, acting out what happened in the Old Testament. And Moses gets ten commandments from God, and he goes up a mountain, and, and God speaks to him, and he comes down and goes, these are the rules that God wants us to do. But, but they were more than rules. God gave a set of rules and regulation, not because he wanted a group of people to, to follow a list of rules. God desired relationship. And he was a holy God that desired relationship with a people that were sinful and left to their own. They would find things that would destroy themselves. And so God gave them a set of rules and regulations so that they could make the proper sacrifices to him, so that they could get to know who he is, that they could be in the presence of him. And so God gave these rules and regulations so that these people could be in relationship with him. The Old Covenant is God's promise that if Israel obeyed these rules, that he would be their God and that they would be his people. All about relationship. In fact, Exodus chapters 19 to 24 is all about God giving the old covenant. It's all about God saying, hey, I want you to be my people. I want you to be in relationship with me. And the rest of the Old Testament after Exodus 24 is, is really about how Israel did. If they honored the rules that God gave them or if they didn't. And, and these rules that God gave in a sense, we're like marriage vows. God was promising to his nation a conditional agreement. If you follow me, you are going to be blessed. If you obey me, you are going to be my people, and I am going to be your God. But if you disobey me, if you break these rules, you are going to be disciplined. You are not going to be my people. You're not going to represent me at all. And we see throughout the history of Israel, throughout the Old Testament, Israel had moments where they obeyed God, and they had moments, most of the time, where they were in disobedience with God. We see that, that Israel obeyed God in passages like 1 Kings chapter 22. This is when King Josiah was reigning. He became king at eight years old. And during his reign, when he was eight years old, the nation of Israel didn't even know who God was. They did not know that God had made vows to them as a nation, making a promise to them that they would be their, his people, that he would be their God. They had fallen so far away from God that they didn't even know him. And when King Josiah turned 18 years old, some people found the law. Can you believe it? The, the old covenant, this, these marriage vows were lost and where do they find them? They found them in the temple. So, so the people of Israel had a temple so that they could worship their God and they weren't even going there. They didn't even know what the old covenant was. After King Josiah had the old covenant read to him, he repented and he realized, this is the God of the universe who gave relationship with us so that we could be with him. And he repented, and the nation of Israel repented. And for a short season, there was revival in the land. There was a short season where people were being blessed because they were walking with God the way that God had instructed, the way that God had promised them. Most of the time in the Old Testament, though, we have examples that look like Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 23 
which says, Because you have burnt incense and have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him or followed his laws or his decrees or his stipulations, this disaster has come upon you as you now see. Israel wrestled just like we all wrestle, just like I wrestle in obeying God. And they fell short just like we all fall short. When Israel didn't obey God, he would send in people like the Philistines and like the Babylonians who would beat them up until they remembered the covenant, these these marriage vows that God made with his people. The next thing I want to point out about the old covenant is that Christ completely fulfilled the old covenant law. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. There was no one in the history of this planet that could live according to the standard that God had put in his law. There was no one who could obey it perfectly. And so God himself came down to earth in the flesh, was born as a baby, grew up, and lived the perfect letter of the law with the perfect motives of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He was the only one that could live up to the standard of righteous living that God had given. And when Jesus was dying on the cross, he shouted out, It is finished. And what he was saying is that this old covenant, this old law is done. It's been fulfilled. He lived the perfect life. He had perfect righteousness. And so everyone who believes in him would have eternal life and would have his righteousness. And no longer did people have to obey a conditional covenant in order to be right with God, that Jesus himself lived the perfect life. He obeyed, and he gives out his righteousness. And so Jesus Christ is the only one who fulfilled the old covenant. He didn't abolish it. He didn't do away with it. He lived it out perfectly to the letter of the law, with the right motives. And next thing that I want to say about the Old Covenant is that the Old Covenant was never intended to save souls. Instead, it was there to teach Israel that they needed Christ. If you're taking notes, let me say that one more time. The Old Covenant was never intended to save souls. Instead, it was there to teach Israel that they needed Christ. In many ways, the Old Covenant is like this mirror. And when people look into the mirror, they they see a reflection of what is there. Uh, I I don't need a lot of prep when I get up in the mornings. This morning, I woke up, I went into the bathroom, I washed the sleep out of my eyes, I did my hair, I checked out my guns. And uh, the, the mirror gave me an absolute reflection of what was going on. It showed me what was wrong. And, and if I had a blemish on my face, if there was a spot on my face right now, I wouldn't go to it and begin to like rub my face up against it because that would be silly. The mirror doesn't fix any spots or blemishes. The mirror, its job is to reflect what's really happening. And so if I look in the mirror and I go, okay, I need to lose some weight, I'm not going to grab it and, and want, wish, wish for it to like suck the fat out of me. It doesn't do that. If I look at the mirror and go, man, I I look 10 years older than what I did 10 years ago. I can't touch it and magically look younger. This, all it does is reflect what's really going on. The Old Covenant does the exact same thing. The Old Covenant is a list of rules and regulations that God gave Israel, Mount Sinai. And as people are reading the Old Covenant, as they're looking through these rules, they see who God is. And they see where they do not measure up. And as they go through that, they go, oh, I got to change this. Okay, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder to have no other gods before my one God. I'm going to try harder, try harder. And ultimately, they end up failing because the old covenant doesn't change us. It was never intended to save souls. The old covenant was put here to show Israel and to show us that we 
need a Savior, that we need Jesus Christ to come into our lives and make a change. And so many of us, when we're wrestling within our marriages and we're wrestling with the hurt and the sin because of our spouse, our, our, our spouses are hurtful people, right? They, they do things and they say things that hurt us from the inside, and they're the ones that are supposed to love us. And when we go, all right, I'm going to fix this situation. I, I want change in this situation. Coming up with a list of rules and conditional agreements is never going to have lasting change. Lasting change in marriage, real and lasting change, only comes from a sustained vision of Jesus Christ. And that's where we find ourselves today in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We have the Apostle Paul sharing two different covenants. There's the old covenant and there's a new covenant. And the argument is this. The new covenant is way better. The gospel of Jesus Christ is way better. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ does, doesn't show you, just show you where you fall short, but it saves you. It rescues you. It gives you a new identity. It gives you a new purpose. Go ahead and read with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says this. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who, put a, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is spirit. I told you this passage was a little abstract. It might be tough to understand it the first time through, but we're going to break it down today. The Apostle Paul is trying to do a couple things. The first thing that he's trying to do is he, he's trying to prove his, his authority. You see, before uh, we even get to chapter 3, we have a couple chapters leading up to this. And before even those chapters were, were written down, Paul wrote a letter to this church saying, you need to turn. You need to turn to Jesus. You need to stop doing some of the things that you're doing. They're hurting the church. And there were people within the congregation who did not like that. And because they did not like it, instead of changing, they decided to challenge Paul. And they said, well, who are you to tell us anything? And so the first part of 2 Corinthians, the first few chapters, is all about Paul uh, giving credibility to what has happened to him. And he states, Jesus Christ transformed me. I was this. I encountered Jesus. And there is new life inside of me. I was dead. And now I'm alive. And even you are a reference to me because many of you encountered Jesus Christ. You were dead. And now you are alive. You used to follow rules and try to try harder. And then all of a sudden, God changed you from the inside and showed you grace. And all of this is happening. And so he's saying in verse 12, this is an amazing hope. We have this hope. And he's saying that me and my companions, we are going to speak boldly about it. Because God has transformed us and we can't help but to get that out there. And so Paul's saying, since we have this hope, me and my companions, we're going to be bold about it. And, and we are going to let as many people know that Jesus changes lives that jesus is the answer and if you'd like to see real change that the only way that that's going to happen is that if you have a sustained vision of jesus christ the second thing that paul does and that's where we're going to spend the most of our time on is is he's he's comparing the two different covenants he's comparing the old covenant and he's comparing the new covenant he says in verse 13 here that not like moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Now, this is kind of a long, drawn-out way to say that the Old Covenant was coming to an end. 
That's, that's what Paul's saying. He's, he's referencing a passage of scripture found in Exodus chapter 34. And, and in this passage of scripture, I encourage you to write it down and to read it at home. But Moses is given the Ten Commandments by God at Mount Sinai. For 40 days, Moses spends time with God. And it is a good time that Moses has with the creator of this universe. And when Moses comes down the mountain, his face is glowing in the dark. And when people see it, they're, they're terrified of it. He, he is shining, and the people are afraid, and they tell him to cover up. But, but Moses doesn't do that. Not yet. He gathers everyone, and he explains everything that God told him up on Mount Sinai. And then he put a, a veil over his face. This text tells us because what he put a veil over because of the outcome of what was being brought to an end. You see, when Moses spent time with God, he would start to radiate and he would glow. He would reflect the glory of God. But as he spent time with the people, this glory was fading. He, his face stopped glowing. And he didn't want people to see that it was fading. It was going away. And so Moses would spend time with God, and he'd take the veil off. He would go in what's called the tent of meetings, and a cloud would hover over this tent. And the Bible says that Moses would talk to God as a man talks with another man face to face. And when he would come out, he would be glowing, and the people would be terrified. But Moses would gather them. He would instruct them. He would tell them everything that God said. And then after he left, he would put a veil on. Because this, this glory was leaving him. And so in our text, in verse 13, it says, We have this amazing hope in verse 12. Verse 13, not like Moses. The covenant that Jesus gives us, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is never going to end. The old covenant was meant to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ and to have an end time. But the new covenant, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus came down to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, defeated sin, defeated death, you are always going to have hope in that. If you look at Jesus Christ and get to know who he is, you are going to reflect him and it's going to be glorious. Not like Moses where it's going to fade after a while. When you encounter Jesus Christ, you are going to reflect his glory, and this is permanent. And so that's a difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, is that this is permanent. The gospel of Jesus Christ is permanent. You will change from death to life. You will change from rule-based living to grace-based living. Paul tells us in our text that not everyone is going to do this, right? Verses 15 and 16. He said, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to, the, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. This text is saying that there are some people whose minds are hardened. They are calloused. And they... There's a covering. If you get a callus, if you cut yourself, or if you play guitar and you wear on something long enough, there's skin that covers over it, and it becomes hard. It becomes calloused. And what Paul is saying, that there are people who every single day, they, they, they live by the old covenant. They live by a list of rules and regulations that God give, gave. And they, they know that they're not measuring up. They look into the law, and they see the blemish all over. They know they don't measure and, and what's happened is instead of seeking Christ, who is what the law was intended for, right? The law wasn't intended to save us, but to show us that we need a Savior. Instead of seeking after Christ, they continue to go back to this over and over and over again. And eventually, they're hard. They're like, oh, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to put more effort into this. I'm going to try these set of rules or these different things. And they never, ever measure up. And so they know that. And so what they do is they take a veil and they wrap it around their face. And they go, oh, maybe this will take away the blemish on my face. It doesn't do that. All it does is it covers it. Everything is still there. And Paul says their minds 
are hard. They are calloused. Every time the Old Covenant is read, every time the law is read, instead of now looking at it and going, this is where I'm at. I need a savior for change to happen in my life. I need a, a savior for any type of change to take place within my marriage. They're just covering up and coming up with excuses. That's not the way of the new covenant. And this is pretty amazing. When, when we get into this, the gospel, on the other hand, in verse 16, says that when one turns to the Lord, when you turn to Jesus, everything changes. When we go to the mirror, all of a sudden, we're not looking into the old covenant that's showing us who God is and how we don't measure up. When you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we look into the mirror and Jesus is standing back at us. Isn't that amazing? That if you believe in the new covenant, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith and your hope in Jesus Christ, you have turned and you are now looking at Jesus. He is standing there looking right back at you. We do not measure up. We fall short over and over again. We fall short within our marriages. We fall short in all of our relationship. We fail time and time again. But Jesus didn't. He fulfilled the old covenant. And so when you go, I am going to turn. I am going to turn away from these idols, these things that I like to look at, these things that, that take control of my life and I want in my life. And I'm going to say goodbye to those. And I'm going to turn to the face of Jesus. He's right there standing back at us. That is amazing hope. And then Paul goes on a little bit further. And he says in verse 18. Let me find it here. He says, and we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into are being transformed into the same image from the one degree of glory to another. Paul's saying that when you embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you embrace not just the rules and everything else, but you realize that Jesus lived by the rules, that Jesus lived the perfect life that you were not able to, and you turn to him, we could look inside the mirror with unveiled faces, and we're going to reflect Jesus. We are going to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is amazing. I wish I could put the right words together to communicate how awesome it is that when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you believe in the gospel, Jesus is looking right back at you. And he's not just saved you for heaven, which he has done, and, and that's amazing, but he's saving us every single day by transforming us into the image of himself. What marriage wouldn't want their spouse to look more like Jesus, right? What marriage would, would benefit if you look more like Jesus Christ? I have a, a sister who's a few years younger than I am. And uh, her name's Jolene. And she's married to, to a military person. Uh, he's in the Navy. And, and because of that, she has moved several places. And she's traveled from place to place to place. She's lived in Connecticut. She's lived in Seattle. She's living in Louisiana right now. And in a couple months, they're moving to Hawaii, which I can't wait to visit. Um, but, but one of the funny things is when I talk with my sister, uh, she, she changes her language a little bit based on the location that she's at. She's, now, she's been in Louisiana for a few years now, and she kind of has this southern, this southern draw when she talks, when she communicates. It's a little bit slower. She says things like, y'all, and uh, it's like, you were raised in Sacramento, Jolene. Why are you talking like that? But, but it's part of the same thing that we're talking about. When you behold Jesus Christ, you're going to be transformed and begin to look more and more like him. Just like when my sister is beholding the people who talk slower with these funny accents in Louisiana, she begins to be transformed and it comes out within her language. The exact same thing happens within our marriages. 
If you want change in your marriage because your spouse has sinned against you and it hurts, behold Jesus. Don't be the disciplinarian. Don't be the one saying you need to be punished now, you need to be disciplined. That's going to destroy the relationship. Behold Jesus Christ. If you need to grow deeper in love with your spouse, behold Jesus Christ. Jesus is sitting on the throne. He has defeated death. He has defeated sin. The Bible tells us that one day everyone in this world is going to see him and their response is going to be that they're going to hit their face to the floor and they're going to worship. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus is bigger than your spouse's sin. Jesus is bigger than those idols that you think you want, those things that you look at that you feel like you can't get rid of. If you want to get rid of something in your life, behold Jesus. Have a sustained vision that his ways are amazing, that he is glorious, and he is transforming you into something glorious. After the last service, someone said, I loved what you said, Pastor John, but just tell me how. Look at Jesus. That means waking up in the morning and beholding him, going, God, this day is for you. I am in your hands. Help me see you today. Couples, if you want to see real change that lasts inside of your marriage, behold Jesus. Grab your spouse by the hand and spend some time learning, seeking, understanding who God is. It's not that hard. Carve out some time to look at him to gaze into his beauty, into his glory, knowing that the gospel tells us that when we behold him, when we turn and we look at him, he is going to transform us. And so you could do that today, and I'm going to encourage you to do that as we respond right now. There may be some of you who go, this is brand new to me, old covenant, new covenant. No matter what you think about how I communicated, Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine. And right now, his desire for you is to turn from death to life, to be able to, to live the grace-filled life that he purchased for you when he died on the cross. And right where you're seated, you could go, Jesus, I believe in you. I want this new covenant. I want this gospel. And you're going to see change take place within your life. If you're in a marriage and it's on the rocks right now and it is wrestling can't say it enough behold jesus christ even if your spouse doesn't because god will work through that he will help you to look more like jesus christ so that you could love with the same type of love that he gives us so that you could serve with the same type way that he serves us so i'm going to ask the worship team to come up just to play and i'm going to challenge you right now to pray if you're married pray with your spouse Pray that your marriage would reflect Jesus Christ, that you would behold him, and that he would change in your life. Some of you, you may need to, to repent, to confess, to realize that, you know what, I haven't been living the way that God wants me to live. Jesus lived it for you, but he doesn't want you to go down the road of destruction. He wants you to behold him and to allow him to transform you. So let's spend some time praying for marriages here. If you're single or widowed or a widower, pray that Jesus would transform you or pray for the marriages here. When marriages improve, we improve. The, the children that are in the, these marriages' lives improve. And so let's pray that God, through his gospel, would begin to change our marriages. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church Podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.